and Christ as the Son of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, we're going to be looking at verse 24. <coughs> Jesus made this statement here. He says in verse 24, Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Belief is absolutely necessary. This is the point that we will hammer over and over again with our religious brain. Yes, faith is absolutely essential. Hebrews 11, verse 6, makes that a of claim. And we cannot come to God unless we believe that He is. But we do not have faith if we're not acting upon what God has said. It'd be like if you're taking your wedding vows and you, you said, oh yeah, I truly believe I love this individual that's sent across me to be your future husband and future wife. Um, I, I, I'm willing to profess all that stuff, but you know, when it push comes to shove, do I really have to take care of them in sickness? What if they get really poor? Do I really have to keep going with that? We won't think about it that way. We won't, do, we won't even thought would have crossed our mind that somehow we would say, you know, I love this person, I believe in this person, but when push comes to stuff, I'm not really going to fall through with what I say I believe in. You know, the eunuch in Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 8, when Philip preaches Christ unto him, starting around verse 35, they come to some water, if you remember there in that passage, And the eunuch exclaims when they come to that water, that there's water. What hinders me from being baptized? I want you to see the connection that faith and baptism have together. So verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And they went along the road, and they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, filled as well as a eunuch, and he baptized him. When we're baptized, we are making good on our, our professed faith that Jesus is the Christ, and he is who he says he is. As I say, I believe in Jesus, and yet will not simply follow what he has said, for example, in Mark 16, verse 16. I mean, that's red letter edition, you know, the one who believes and is baptized shall be saved, the one who does not believe shall be condemned. I'm not willing to follow through on that. I can't really say I have biblical faith. Also shows when we're baptized, faith in the gospel. Turn over to Mark 16. We just uh, quoted that a moment ago, but Mark 16, starting verse 15. Mark's account of the Great Commission. He, Jesus makes this statement. Mark 16, verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He was believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but you as disbelieved shall be condemned. Who are they believing? Jesus said, go and preach the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that Mark's gospel even begins with these words. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. So all that he did, all he lived, his life, his teaching, his atoning sacrifice, that's the gospel that is to be preached. And we show our faith in that gospel when we obey the Lord's commands and be baptized. You know, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul made that point about the gospel being the power to save. He says in the 16th verse of Romans 1, that he was not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes the Jew first and also the Greek. It's always interesting to me when I come across a new video, a new article, a new comment and commentary, whatever it may be, trying to explain away baptism. In fact, when you just, as we'll see at the end of the night, when you mount up all that the Bible has to say about the essentiality and the necessity, excuse me, preaching for a long week, and you get tongue-tied, the necessity for baptism, it's a pretty heavy case. Anecdotally, I was in Target's parking lot one day. This was back in the spring of last year. 
It was only 99, so I thought I had time. There was some street, uh, a house church in Tucson, and they were sending their kids out to do street preaching and so forth. And one approached me in my car, as I'm trying to get my car out. I look at my watch, I'm like, yeah, I got time. I didn't have my Bible with me, but she started to talk about, you know, well, how, how do you believe in Jesus? So, uh-huh. I believe in Jesus. Are, are, are you saved? I know I'm saved. Because <coughs> I obeyed the gospel. And I, how I did that was I believed in Jesus and I was baptized in the my sins. Do you, have you done that? She said, no, I haven't done that. <coughs> so, well, well, what not? Well, it's, it, it, it's something important, but it's not really something you, it's not necessary. Well, I quote from memory acts eight. It's like, okay, remember, she was from with store of the unit. It's not necessary. Why do you have to stop the chariot? It's not necessary. Why did think of Cornelius? Why did he send for Peter? It's not necessary. Why did the apostles have a ton to say about it? You could go down the list of this cumulative case. I haven't believed in the gospel unless I believe fully and obey the gospel and what it teaches. Baptism is also the means by which we get into the body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, Starting verse 22. Speaking of the, of the rule and authority and dominion of Christ, Paul says this in verse 22. And he put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, we, we talked about that the other night when we talked about the church. Body of Christ is identified as the church. One, there is salvation in no other body except the Lord's body. Our religious friends will agree upon that. You have to be in Jesus if you want to be saved. Well, you go over to 1 Corinthians 12. Now, Paul here is making a point to the Corinthians about the value that each of us provides to the body. We all have a different part to play. We each have a different function. But he makes his point in verse 13. Well, let's go in verse 12 and 13 for context. He says, For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of, of the body, yet though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Again, you can just emphasize the fact that baptism stands between you being outside the body of Christ inside the body of Christ. It's a, it's a, there's a reason why John, in John's gospel, Jesus refers to it as the new birth. It brings one into this relationship. In Galatians chapter 3, baptism is spoken of as, as what puts us in Christ, or being in Christ, being clothed with Him. In Galatians, the third chapter, starting verse 26, Galatians chapter 3, we're going to be around verse 26. Now Paul has just gotten done talking about what the purpose of the law was. It was to lead people to faith once Jesus came. And verse 26 he says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, the more knowledgeable authorities, as I know enough great to get myself in trouble and to be a danger to myself and others, but the more knowledgeable, credible authorities have told me that that word for there, guard, is because, in this sense. So what Paul is really saying here is, the reason why you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, verse 26, is because all of you were baptized into Christ and you have clothed yourselves with pride. That's why we can be called the children of God. We've put ourselves, we've we have accepted Christ as Lord. We put Him on in baptism. We've had our sins washed away. We've been added to the body. It puts us in to Christ, where salvation is. That's not all. I just give away the point, but baptism also signifies a cleansing of sin. In Titus chapter 3, in verse 5, One of my favorite sections of all scripture actually is in this beginning part of chapter, chapter 3 of Titus. 
Let's get the full impact. Let's actually start in verse 3. Speaking of us, she said, For we also were once foolish in ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, uh, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, this, this language of washing away sins, this regeneration also pops up when Paul talks about his conversion in Acts 22 and verse 16. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, Paul will give his account of conversion before the Jewish council there. Relates what Ananias told him on that day he had the gospel preached to him. Ananias said to him after he had preached the gospel, he said to Paul, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name. So baptism signifies a washing, a cleansing of our spirits and our souls that we may stand justified before our God. It's when the double cure is applied to our double problem that sin provides. There's sin causes. See, when we sin, there's, we have two issues. We died inside, our souls be, our, became dead, and we were lawbreakers. And so Christ's blood, his atoning sacrifice, is the double cure. Because of what Christ did on our behalf, we can stand justified right before God, and we can be cleansed, and our souls be resurrected to new life. That's what Paul's talking about in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. But also baptism signifies the death. We're going to, for these next couple points, we're going to be in Romans chapter 6. Starting in verse 1, rather. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Now what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. See, the problem that Paul was dealing with preemptively is that based on the previous argument that where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more, some might have had the wrong conclusion that, oh, if grace abounds or sin abounds, I can keep sinning, God gets more grace, and it looks better. That's why Paul says, shall we continue in sin? God forbid, the old American standard said. Because he said, we died to sin. Well, why did you die to sin? Verse 3, it was baptism. Because in baptism, we are unite ourselves in the likeness of Christ's death, also his burial. Verse 4 there, let's look at that again. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death. So as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. There's something so significant about baptism that Paul can call it a spiritual death, burial, and resurrection. It is a landmark in the life in our lives that separates the old life of sin from the new life in Christ. That we die to our old sinful ways. Dead people are buried, just as Christ was buried. And just as Christ was risen on the third day, we are immediately risen up from that watery grave to walk in new life. In a very real sense, we reenact the gospel when we obey the gospel. Because we have died to our ways, baptism also signifies a changing of goals or um, uh, desires in life. In Colossians, for example, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3 here. Colossians 3, looking at the first three verses.
Here we have this resurrection language again from Romans 6. He says in verse 1, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, seek, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who was alive, is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. Again, I, I tell you of this new convert where I preach. You want to talk about a change of goal and a change of life. She is in her 70s. She spent the last, basically, 68 years, if you will, as a radical, militant feminist who hated God, hated the Bible, went to seminary and liberal institution to try and disprove it. But two or, two or three years ago now, when she was presented the unadulterated gospel, and I take no credit for that, it was something completely different, she didn't believe it, and she obeyed it. And since that time, she has gone from being a hateful, filled person to a disciple who has completely transformed her life. When we did our Acts class, she told us at the end of it that she used to hate the Apostle Paul. She thought he was a misogynistic, bigoted, awful, hateful man. At the end of seeing his life in the book of Acts, she said, at the end of this class now, I seem to be one of the most loving, caring Christians who has ever lived. Talk about new goals. Talk about a change of life, change of mind, change of priorities. Baptism brings that about. Baptism is what brings one into that new life. Baptism is that landmark in a person's life that allows them to pivot, to stop seeking the things of themselves and start seeking the things of God. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Baptism and loss the means by which we get into the family of God. In Acts 2 and verse 47. The day of Pentecost, after the gospel had been preached, the 3,000 were baptized in verse 41. How they were continuing to devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking bread, the fellowship, and prayers in 42. We see in verse 47, the New American Standard reads this. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. To their number there, the New King James and King James has, to the church. It's the same wording in the Greek. It's just translated differently. It means the same exact thing. When one is baptized, they're added to the body of Christ, the people that belong to Jesus, this great family of God. You know, when I met Mike in 2015 in that week-long preacher training program, it was the first time I had ever actually gone away from home on my own. And my grandmother, who was a homebody, was terrified for me. And I was able to say to her, like, I don't know the brethren in Cookville, but I know the brethren in Cookville. That makes sense. I've never met them, but I know them because they're fellow believers. They have believed the same gospel as I have. And if they're half of what they should be by the text, they're going to be a hospitable, loving, caring group of Christians. I have nothing to worry about. And I was overfed that week. <laughs> and overworked, as Micah probably could attest. And that's the same thing no matter where you travel. You are, when you are added to the body of Christ, you're added to a large family, larger than you can ever imagine. When I was in training in Beaverton, uh, you know, most kids in the world were lucky to have one overbearing mother. I had a congregation full of them, and they made sure I was taken care of, sometimes too much. Uh, that's some of the byproduct or some of the other blessings of being in the family of God. You're taken care of. You're blessed with so many relationships that you may not have had, otherwise had. I find it so amazing where orphans can have parents in the body of Christ. Uh, people who perhaps never had the grandfather figure or, or fathers who could lead them spiritually, they now get that in the body because they were added to it by baptism to this great family of God. You've been in a very attentive audience tonight. I appreciate it. We have one more point. Probably the most important. 
Baptism signifies salvation from our sins. And 1 Peter chapter 3 and 21. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Speaking of comparing or how no one and his family were saved through the ark by the flood, Peter writes in 21, correspond to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A friend of mine, David Halbrook, uh, preached up in Fairbanks. They will rent a booth uh, for the state fair up there. And they will just have a question on the board. And their way is, they'll put, does baptism save you? And they get a lot of responses. And almost universally, everyone says, well, no, it doesn't. And they have a, just a plain old pew Bible, open to this verse, highlighted. And most people have to do a triple check. Not a double check, triple check. It's like, is this, they'll ask them, is this a joke Bible? Did you do this? Like, no, you can check it. Says Sondra Van, copyrights to some printing house back east. We didn't touch it. That's what the text says. And I love how Peter also rules out any sort of symbol, uh, ceremonial form of baptism. But Peter's quick to say it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. He's not saying this isn't a bathroom tank. This is not some sort of Jewish ritual. This is what one does in order to be saved. But since in baptism, as we talked about before, one shows or demonstrates their faith in Christ and what he said. That's what Peter could say in, over in chapter 5, verse 4. That those who have been baptized into Christ can look forward to when the chief shepherd appears and we will receive the unfading crown of glory. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never been baptized. I hope that this cumulative case has been convincing. Maybe you have questions and we would love to sit down with you and, and study with you. Micah is a very capable man and I can tell the members here are all very capable and can answer your Bible questions. And those for us who have been a Christian for a length of time, I hope this lesson has brought some new understanding or greater appreciation for how God put baptism in the plan of salvation. I have no long invitation slide tonight. Simply, I will repeat what Adam and I have said Why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins. Call on us now. Your Sunday morning invitation tonight is to invite the God to stand and sing the song.